take this idea of a possible future, turn it into something tangible, and then hopefully make people uncomfortable so that they talk about it. Welcome back to the podcast Heja Framtiden, a Swedish uh, podcast on the future. My name is Christian von Essen, sitting here today at Gather in Stockholm, Slaktusområdet, uh, together with Casey Huditz. Welcome to the show. Hello, happy to be here, Christian. Uh, you did a talk earlier today, more or less about AI, but uh, lots of other topics as well. Um, and you work as a uh, UX designer in Chicago. That's right, um, yeah. Primarily for a company called DocuSign, DocuSign, and you also have uh, lots of other projects. Tell us a bit about your your life and what you do at the moment. Yeah, sure. So I am a uh, product design manager at DocuSign. That is my day job. It's been a great place to work. Um, wonderful colleagues. On um, my side job, or <laughs> other part of my life, is where I like to do public speaking and teaching and different short film projects and things that just satisfy the creative part of me that working in a again a great company just doesn't also often satisfy it's just not it's just not there you're using a different kind of creativity so um being here at the festival i'm lucky enough to be able to share two of the projects i've worked on um one is the bear test which we can talk about and then the other one is uh speculative design and how it relates to the show black mirror so those will be my two focuses and it's been a life goal to speak at an international conference so to be invited here and it not be some fire festival scam like i'm just so happy that this is happening so really happy to be here yeah. wow great uh no it's not fire festival <laughs> remember that sandwich picture yeah, i was yeah. afraid that would be lunch i'd be like oh they got me <laughs> yeah but let's talk about the the bear test uh because it uh evolves around a children's book by john clausen uh, which uh, is a well, a book author uh, that I love uh, really. I'm uh, reading you know, him. An illustrator too, and yeah, yeah, that's great. reading a lot of his books with my kids. And you use that book to sort of challenge artificial intelligence and its development by sort of applying. We're seeing if they can recognize the subtleties of human storytelling. In a way, is that a correct? way to describe it yeah it, it absolutely came from a desire to understand how smart is the ai that we hear this godlike technology what could it actually do in a very relatively rudimentary way that a five-year-old could figure out could our smartest systems so i was um really interested in how this book where have you read the book beforehand so you knew okay so that just the ending of the book is a, a dark twist that one of the characters eats the other but it doesn't say it explicitly so my challenge which i called the the bear eats a rabbit or the bear test was an attempt to understand artificial intelligence through that question could ai recognize the characters could ai understand the nuance of the story could ai look at the these different words and pictures together to make some sort of sense of it. And that, that question kicked me off into this year long. Yeah. I mean, I guess I've been recording it for like four years now of, of talking to AI um, artists and uh, software engineers and consultants and someone at open AI and a tech emotionographer. And I hosted a panel at South by Southwest and I made a short film about it. And it's just, again, some of my favorite humor is when an absurd idea is taken very seriously. And this kind of feels that way because <laughs> it's kind of, ultimately, it's kind of a silly question. But it, it, for me, it's been this interesting lens through which to try to understand what's happening in the world of AI. And I've just been able to meet a lot of people and learn on the topic. So it's been great. Yeah. And you, you did the same test on your son as well to yeah. see, to keep asking him who, and what happened to the rabbit, right? Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of, uh, in the field of AI, there's a different approaches as well of trying to get um, intelligence, not from brute force and large data models, but actually developing systems that learn like a child so that they can consume the information like my young children, my, my two sons might. And as part of this project, almost in parallel and almost like a coming of age story, I, I recorded and tracked along with my oldest son. Henry and just trying to catch the moment when he might understand that ending. So it felt like 
there were two races in the story of like, when could AI get it? When could a kid get it? And uh, I, I liked playing with those two narratives and story arcs um, to pull together the, the talk. It's also been a way to describe the actual development that has happened during the past five years or so, that when you first started, the AI platforms had no idea what the ending was. And now uh, you actually found uh, an answer that was correct. Yeah, so one platform, uh, GPT-3, which is one of the larger language models at the moment from OpenAI, but I know is being outdone by Google and other places with Lambda and these other models. When I started this in 2017, that that model had not been released. But after I released this idea, someone was able to take just a text version of the story and put it into GPT-3 and then it answered the ending. So it didn't get all of the parts of it, but it was able to answer um, that part of the story. And I just find that fascinating that from the point of me having this idea until now, things have moved so fast that it couldn't have even done that when I thought of this years ago. So it's, um, yeah, the speed of it. And there's a very good chance that someone could sit down, maybe you, if you have the background that could take GPT-3 and some image recognition software and somehow mash them together and it could answer it. But, and I even pitched that to uh, some PhD students <laughs> at the university and they roundly ignored me. Um, but there's a very good chance this could be done and no one's taking the time. And when there was online debate about it, that was a big takeaway is like, if someone could just, if someone took the time, it could be done. I don't know. But again, this, like back to your point, the speed at things are going there's a very good chance it's already been done or could be done, yeah. And you talked a bit about this on stage with your uh, colleagues um, about the um, ratification of certain uh, job titles or professions or at least tasks to begin with. And I think it's interesting that this has moved so fast into the creative yeah. department. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> everyone's talking about, you know, administration, processing, legal documents, uh, big chunks of data. Mm -hmm. But now we see artists, photographers, even journalists being thoroughly challenged. How do you view that kind of development? Where do you think we're going with this? Yeah, that's a great question. And when I started my investigation into the capabilities and limitations of AI, I was coming from a mindset of um, autonomous vehicles are going to transform cities and the biggest profession in the US is drivers and let it be truck drivers or, or Uber drivers and that's where it's going. And my whole mind was there and I read this book called AI Superpowers by Kai-Fu Lee. It was incredible and it completely changed the way I thought about it where he would argue those big autonomous vehicles require machinery and maintenance and, and software and hardware updates. Whereas if you develop one little piece of code, it could, it could wipe out a back office person because it can figure out, oh, I can move things from one spreadsheet to another. It's not that complicated. But in terms of the, the jobs themselves, I, I like to console myself or think about that they, they say how high touch jobs will most likely have a harder time to be eliminated. And by that, it means like I, I moved into management now. So I'm overseeing a team and I'm working with just great people to make sure that they can deliver. Whereas if I was, um, there's famous story about like radiologists that like a machine learning algorithm can look at a million examples to then get this incredible corpus of information to say if this is cancer or not and make the decision with a higher accuracy than a radiologist. So Kai-Fu Lee was making the point of like, it's the white collar jobs that'll disappear faster than those those blue collar driving or plumbing or whatever jobs that maybe the robotics uh, folks might think of. But back to the point, I find it really fascinating too. I spoke with an artist named um, Andreas Refsgaard and he's based in Copenhagen, a fantastic guy. And he's someone that plays with AI to as an artist to see what can be done. So for computer vision, he would figure out that he could draw instruments and then hold the camera on it, and then it would start generating a song with that instrument that he had drawn. It could recognize it. Or um, if you go to a news article and it's blocked because of a paywall, his you'd use GPT-3 to just read the beginning of it, and then it would just write the rest of the article. <laughs> but as a way to show like what, what it can do. It seems almost easier, and I think my project maybe shows it, it seems easier easier is like not meant to be dismissive, but to generate a million ideas than to perceive the world as it is. So to your point about artists using it, it seems like if I could go and say, write me a, a story about the Gather Festival and this podcast interview in the style of Shakespeare, GPT-3 could do that. But if, if I were to make a joke, could it explain to me why 
it wasn't funny because I'd make a bad joke, but explain that piece to me and the understanding and the nuance and the perception, that seems like a greater challenge. I saw just the other day that Shutterstock declines AI produced images oh, on their on their platform. People were upset with this um, artist that used uh, Midjourney to to win a, uh, an art prize, even though he said it was uh, yeah. he was using Midjourney. And I think the same will go probably with music, mm. um, where an AI can probably create thousands of pop songs in yeah. in a few days and um, take over copyright. There, um, it, there's something called like copyright.ai, where it's exactly that. It's just explain your business in explain your business in natural language, and we're going to give you articles to write, headlines, banners to put on your site, A-B test, all this stuff. Like, it's just, it can it can do it all that way. Sorry, I cut you off, but yeah, that's something no. I know exists. Yeah, it's crazy. And and if we move into the future a bit, let's move to your other side project, uh, which is called Speculative Design, with the foundation of uh, using uh, Black Mirror, right? The Netflix TV series. What, what is it that you do uh, when you explore that? Yeah, so years ago, I hosted an event in Chicago, which was, I, I called Reflecting on Black Mirror, and I just had a bunch of designers take some aspect of the show and then break it down. So look at it from a technical point of view, look at it from an ethics point of view. And one of them introduced the idea of speculative design. I had never seen the future cones or, or, or anything about that. And she and I reworked that into a South by Southwest talk. And over about seven months, we researched and talked to people and, and turned it into this idea where we looked at how Black Mirror uses these what-if situations and they push the envelope with technology and show us this dystopian idea in the same way that a lot of speculative designers, let it be artists or professional designers that are doing this for a company, take this idea of a possible future, turn it into something tangible, and then hopefully make people uncomfortable so that they talk about it. And we thought like, okay, there's a pretty good overlap there of what they're doing. There's this foundational book called Speculative Everything. And actually, it kind of lays out what speculative design it is by Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby. They're like the god godparents of this. And they, in the book, they talk about specifically how Black Mirror is an excellent example of how speculative design is used to unnerve people, get people to talk about it. Do we want to be able to record all of our, everything and like in some of the episodes and what would that mean? Similar to what I talked about this morning with the bear test, I feel I have a tendency to take a pop culture idea and then repurpose it to just talk about something else. For whatever reason, my creative process is that way. So as I use the children's book this morning to talk about AI, I use Black Mirror as a way to get into speculative design. So that's that's what I'll be talking about tomorrow <clears throat> and running a workshop on it. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> and uh, what what do you hope that people will get from the workshop? I mean, do they learn to to create speculative designs? Well, so... First off, my hope is that they're entertained. That's something I really want. Um, second, I hope that they take away just the the principles of specular design, what it is. I show a lot of examples to get hopefully people thinking of what it is, what it's for, who makes it, what is it meant to do. One thing is there. there's something called Speculative Futures, and it's a group that's around the world. They have a chapter here in yeah. Stockholm. Maybe you know about it. And I think to get more people even just joining that group or reading these books, especially if we're in the tech and design people that are here, that are that are thinking about it or have the say, I think um, is is just if there's any pause that someone has at work someday and raises a question, I think is wonderful. So uh, to raise awareness of this kind of design as a way to um, facilitate better decisions for the future, if I can in some way turn someone onto that, I feel like that's great. Yeah, but that's what I like about Black Mirror because um, it's not always um, very likely that these things will happen, but it's it's interesting that you take one aspect of new technology and you just pull it into a certain direction very far. But the other parts of the world is still the same. I mean, they're, they're driving like old cars, but they have like um, recordable lenses. Exactly. But I think it is interesting to push the envelope to get you to think that, okay, recordable lenses that would be really cool like a designer would think mm -hmm. uh, or a, a tech developer and then you get to see in practice how that can uh, play out in, in, a, in a real world mm -hmm. where if someone commits a crime and the other other person sees it he will have the recording forever stuck in his in his hardware so you have to kill the other person <laughs> to get the hardware uh, 
which also means that there's no cloud service available. But um, yeah, it's, it's still interesting. Yeah, I think something that also is always asked after I talk about this or give a version of this talk is someone says, this is great, but what do I, what do I do? You know, and I completely agree. There's this quote by Upton Sinclair. He was this famous journalist in the US that he was a muckraker. So we find all these um, horrible things happening and the journalism would transform certain parts of the industry like slaughterhouses, which is funny. We're sitting here now, but he has this quote where he says, um, it's hard for a man to understand something when his salary depends upon not understanding it. And I feel like a lot of speculative design done in the general workplace is counter to what the business needs are. So for example, I worked at um, an agency and a big children's cereal company came to us and said, we want an AR game that can be played at the kitchen table when someone scans it with their phone and then they can play with our character and they can dunk a basketball. So we delivered on that and we hit the marks and they really liked it and it was rolled out. But if I had come back and said, well, you know, I'm going to do a speculative design project of showing the conflict it'll cause with a kid and the mom in the morning when they're trying to get him to go to school and he's trying to dunk a basketball, they don't, they wouldn't want that, right? That that's not They're not looking for the implications of the day-to-day -day disruption that might come with the game. They're looking to deliver and sell more, uh, sell more cereal. So the actual application of serious speculative design in the corporate setting that I've experienced is, is much harder to come by. But if you have these groups like Speculative Futures or you have um, the artists that are producing the work outside of the, the general capitalist sphere, then that's where you can really get the conversations going. It's not just uh, digging into uh, uh, dystopian futures. It's, it's more like trying to predict unforeseen consequences. Yeah, exactly. And on the flip side, I've used this kind of futures work at my current job at DocuSign to get us to think about how AI could be just incredible for our clients in the future as we work it out. So I created this um, this short, again, speculative film. But ultimately what I did was I cut together scenes from the movie Her and made it seem like they were launching our product the first time. And it would be him talking um, and say, yeah, you can look at my files. And then I'd have someone do a voiceover as if they were onboarding to DocuSign for the first time. It's not like unsettling or disruptive, but it's a way to bring something forward to colleagues and say, wouldn't it be great if our if our products were this easy? Like, could we get to this? So it, it generated a little bit of discussion at work, but I always try to find ways of pushing some possible future in a, in a media, easy to consume format. Yeah. I usually ask my guests, uh, what is your best tip for making the world a better place in the future? Since 2020 and feeling this, the feelings of powerlessness of everything that was happening from the virus or the, the pandemic, politics, just how insane it was. I really became more focused in just my neighborhood. So looking at picking up trash, putting up murals in our local park, joining the local school council, starting these bike trains with other families. It can feel very overwhelming, that expression of change the world in some way. But I've just found in the last couple of years, in particular, inspired by the pandemic, of the value of just what do I look at every day? What are things that my sons and I walk past? What is a way that this garbage is not on the street and finding value that way? I grew up on a farm and there was something too about moving something from A to B that feels way more satisfying than every tweet in the world, you know? And I think in, in my small community, being able to make small changes to me feels like a much bigger change than me giving all these talks. They don't really matter <laughs> at the end of the day. So it, I guess to answer your question, it really just comes down to like, what in my day to day that I see every day can be improved? And then what are the ways that I can do it? There was just that speaker. Did you hear him uh, about the infrastructure work Urban and this, planning, yeah. this, that was so inspiring. And that's totally things that I, I think about on a day to day of, you know, what, how could data inform it? How could a bench change something? I don't know. I find that really fascinating. That's also, um, giving agency to yourself as an individual to actually be able to change things and create your future or the common future. I think that's, uh, empowering in a way. Absolutely. And I'm telling you, just getting a, a garbage picker and picking up garbage was like weirdly transformative because it's like, oh, I made a physical, tangible impact here that no amount of decks that I make at work would ever do. It feels like there's a an upward spiral or a, a, a flywheel or whatever, like it's just compounding effects of it. Of 
Yeah, so that, yeah, that's my I'm, take. I'm exactly like that. I, I, I pick up trash every day at, at our street because I want people to see that I'm picking up trash and, yeah. you know, and well, that's not supposed kids, to be there. You have kids yeah, as well. Three. And then you're modeling it for them yeah. and you're, you're showing to them that you care about their environment and where they're growing up and I think it's wonderful. They think it's kind of cringy. Oh, my, my <laughs> wife and sons do too. <laughs> Dad, quit picking shit up. Let's go to the park. I also, when, when people... When, when all these e-scooters fall over on the, on the sidewalk, I pick them up. As, as you should. Be, yeah. uh, it's like the broken windows theory. If, like, if you let one thing go, then it encourages others, right? If you cover up the spray paint right away, then it doesn't encourage other people yeah. to do it. Yeah. We're so good people, really. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you should reframe this whole podcast. It's just <laughs> us as great fathers, great citizens. <laughs> no. It's so. amazing. We really make a difference. Wow. <laughs> you could just edit this whole thing down to just this passage. That'd be great. Yeah. Pat yourself on the back. Um, do you have a good reading tip or podcast tip? You mentioned uh, speculative uh, everything. Yeah, but if if you're looking for a reading tip, I, I cannot recommend this new book that just came out called The Candy House by Jennifer Egan. And it's fiction. And she wrote another book called A Visit from the Goon Squad that won the Pulitzer. And it's fantastic. But The Candy House is all these interconnected stories that are told that all revolve around kind of a black mirror concept that people can um, upload their consciousness or their memories, and then people can search them by latitude and longitude. And that's a part of the story, but it's about much more. And uh, really fantastic book. I couldn't put it down. So The Candy House by Jennifer Egan. Very good. I, I think I read the other book. Oh, you so, did read yeah. A Visit from the Goon Squad? Yeah. I'm rereading it now because it's a lot of the same characters too. Oh, okay. Yeah, that they kind of overlap. But a podcast that it's my favorite of the last couple of years was called either Wind or Winds of Change. And the premise is this rumor a journalist heard, which was that the, a rock song by the Scorpions called Wind of Change was written by the CIA to help overthrow communist Russia. And he just hears this uh, here's this rumor and then he pursues it very seriously as a New Yorker journalist to figure it out in all these interviews. And I just, similar to, I took inspiration from that for mine where it's like a silly premise, but taken incredibly seriously. It's a self-contained, it's one season. It's just really good. So, wow. so it's like trying to debunk conspiracy theory. But then it also gets into like the history of the CIA actually using culture to influence other other countries. And, and so it, it, it goes on all these tangents that are just really fascinating. So highly recommend that too. Wow. Um, who do you think I should interview? In the world? Um, I would interview George Saunders. Do you know who that is? Heard the name? Yeah, he's a, I, he's a short story writer. He won the MacArthur Genius Grant years ago. He writes a lot of speculative fiction, but he's kind of like, did you ever read Kurt Vonnegut? Do you know him, like Slaughterhouse Five? And like, like he, they call him kind of the Kurt Vonnegut of the moment where he just writes these way out there, but highly compassionate um, write-ups. And I've met him a few times and he's so kind. So George Saunders, if you can track him down, he's uh, a man to know. Or another one who might be more attainable is Andreas Refsgaard. And I can send you his information. He is a Danish AI artist who is amazing and super kind and have all these amazing projects so he, he's someone that i'm sure would do this too great thank you so much uh, casey huditz for joining here from today yeah thank you for i'm so glad to be here thanks for taking the time um casey huditz with z dot uh, com you can find uh, stuff that you've done basically yeah. you can be overwhelmed on <laughs> your on your mobile phone um or underwhelmed i guess but yeah that's where you can find what i've done yeah Great. Thank you so much. Um, recording from Gather Festival or Gather Conference uh, 2022 from Stuckters Mrådet in Stockholm. My name is Christian von Essen and check out herframtiden.se for more information about the podcast and my other projects. Thanks so much for listening.